Yeah, the introduction with some food, poem poem about time, and then we did the seasons. There's a time for this, there's a time for that. We did this section on fear of God. Now we're going to do another poem about time. Okay, we'll see how it works in parallel. It's a work in parallel. But the, the shift tonight is not so much knowing the seasons of life. The shift tonight is knowing how to live, knowing that your time is short. How do you live with the fear of God? The book's going to get real, start to get more practical. And tonight, I talked about how the, um, in the introduction, I talked about how this book has a lot of different genres in tonight. Well, tonight, he's going to shift into, into Proverbs. And if, some, if it's Solomon or somebody who's trying to sound like Solomon, that's very natural, right? Because he wrote most of the Proverbs. Well, tonight he's going to give us a series of Proverbs talking about time and the point being knowing that our time is short. All right, here's a quick review. We'll catch you up. What are some of the themes of the book that we've had so far? That we keep hitting time after time. Vanity, 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 vanity. All is vanity. All is absurd on this planet. That's in rebellion against its creator. What else? The dead end of pleasure. Well, life is short. Yeah. There's all these things that take us down the wrong track, away from fearing God. Well, we talk about all these things. Sex, power, uh, money, uh, all these things are, are all dead ends in themselves. You know, I've read something that puts this into a uh, Bible reading I have. We all are looking for paradise. And the only paradise we're going to have is when we see Jesus. That we think if we get this, that's on, on be the ultimate. We go on a vacation, we are everything's on, but there's always some little something that makes it not quite. Yeah. Can't, can't satisfy. Can't satisfy. Can't satisfy. Yeah. yeah. So that's been one of the themes of the book, right? Uh -huh. All these dead ends dead that he's ends. gone through. All right. Well, tonight, like I say, the main theme of the book is fearing God. No, your, your life is short, death is certain, all is vanity, and the right way to live is to fear God. Now he's going to start talking more practically about how we do this. And I called this lesson the two-minute warning. It's football season when I put the notes together. Oh, yeah. But you could have, you, you know, maybe it's the 10-second warning since we're getting ready to do the NCAA brackets here. So when a sports team, let's just go back to football. If you're watching a football game, they get they give the two minute warning. So, what do the teams do knowing that there's only two minutes left? Hurry up! They got to hurry up. They don't make a big play and they start. So they got to push hard. They got to play their best game, right? Mm -hmm. They got to play their best game. Anything else? They have the best players out there. Get their best guys out there. Right. Hopefully they've practiced, right? They've practiced their two-minute drill and all that stuff. A lot of times they take a timeout, right? Before well, they do anything. Well, they can. The two-minute warning is kind of the timeout, right? For the last push, right? And that's kind of what this lesson's getting at tonight. Is your time is short. You gotta play hard. You gotta play with intention. And we're gonna talk a lot about legacy tonight. With the idea that you're playing uh for your your legacy, if you will. Uh, so uh, he's, he's talked, right? We've hit it over and over and over again, this repetitive idea. Life is short, death is certain. Uh, back, if, if you want to look back at Ecclesiastes 2.15, then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it's also it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? I said to myself, this too is vanity. For there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, and as much in the coming days all will be forgotten. And now the wise man and the fool all die alike. Everybody's going to die. And it doesn't matter about how much money you had. It doesn't have, 
you know, what you achieved, what, what wisdom you had, we're all going to die. So that's certain. Uh, I, I won't look at Psalm 139, but I put it in the notes. It says basically the same thing. So this second poem is about time is short. So how do we live wisely? Um, and so kind of like the two-minute warning idea, right? You want to play your best game. And you want to play it today. You don't have tomorrow. When you're two minutes in the game, you can't worry about what's going on after the game. And what went on before in the game, it's done, right? So you got to play your best game now. And that's kind of the upshot of the lesson tonight. And uh, so let's look at this, and we're going to be in Ephesians, Ephesians, Ecclesiastes 7, and I'll read the first four verses here. And this is written in the style of the Proverbs. You're going to, it's going to sound familiar. A good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. It's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Because in the end, it is in, because that is the end of every man. And the living takes it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. The mind of the wise is in the house of the morning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. And Sadie's getting ready to tell me, have you got any more downers that you can give, give me tonight? <laughs> All right? <laughs> So, um, verse 1, a good name is better than a good ointment. What in the world is he talking about? Your reputation is everything. Your like, your, yeah, your reputation and legacy here, right? Your time on earth is short, so what are you going to leave behind, right? Your, your legacy, that's his, that's his big theme tonight, is, his, is your legacy. A good ointment just kind of goes away, right? But your legacy is going to, going to be ongoing. And what that now, you know, most people wouldn't if you ask the person on the street, would you, what's the better day, to be born or to die? Most people would say the better day is to be born. Why does he say it's better, as he says, it's better to go to a house of mourning? How much fun do you have in a, a funeral or a house of mourning? Why would he say that? That person no longer has to um, suffer the troubles of living their life. Okay, <laughs> okay. It, it, there's an escape. Mm -hmm. But think about when you sit there for a funeral. It Doesn't it sober you up? Oh, yeah. One day that's going to be me up there. You know, uh, you know, one day it'll be my family sitting in the pew. One day that's going to be me. It should sober us up. And that's what he's saying. To be in a house of mourning sobers us up. It's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Because that, in the, that is the end of every man in living. Take, the living take it to heart. The living look at life and realize that time is short. That, yeah, that day of our death is coming, and I take it to heart. I live in anticipation of that. I live with my legacy in mind of how, how I'm going to finish the game, right? How am I going to finish this two minutes, if you will? I know of some, some that will not go to a funeral. And that I think that's why, because they cannot face the end. The end. Yeah. Because they don't they really do not know the Lord. I know that. Yeah. But they I don't care if it's their best friend or their they will not go to a funeral. Well, so they don't want to hear. Well that's that's exactly what he's talking about. Uh -huh. That's precisely saying we've got to face the reality of death. And we've got to live accordingly. It didn't go away. No. It didn't go away. Um Proverbs, let me put your finger there, flip back over to Proverbs 22. And uh, Proverbs talks a lot about legacy. Proverbs 22, 1, a good name is to be more desired than great riches. Favor is better than silver and gold. 
The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. So the value, the value says that your, your legacy, your good name, your reputation is worth more than all the silver and gold you could accumulate. And that's what he's saying back over here in Ecclesiastes 7. You need to pay attention to your good name. How are you going to finish the game? How are you going to be, leave a legacy uh, knowing that death is certain? It's real. It's not going away. And that's why being in the house of mourning sobers us up. We have to confront it. You know, and like, like we're talking about, you know, if you're if you're at some uh, 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 social function and you're standing around talking to people and you want to start talking about going to funerals or dying, how, how long does that conversation go on? <laughs> That's what, that's what the preacher is telling us tonight. We have to face this. We have to live in view of our death, the certainty of our death. And that's the wise thing to do. It sobers us up. Um, now, look at verse 4 there. The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. One of the themes through the Proverbs, right? A lot of times they'll compare, there's the, there's the ant, and the ant's working, and then there's the fool that's over here, and he's not working. They're taking care of his business, and he's going to pay a price for that. This is the same structure here in this verse. The wise is paying attention to the day of his oncoming death. The fool is partying in the house of pleasure. All right, same structure as the Proverbs, this versus this. Now, Paul talked about this. Um, I'm going to flip you back. This idea of a good name here. Uh, flip over, put your finger there, and flip over Second Timothy. And Second Timothy is kind of Paul's valedictory uh, letter. I think that's probably the last letter he wrote before he was put to death. And Second uh, Timothy's writing kind of like his last charge to Timothy. Right at the end of the letter, he writes this, and you guys have heard this. And you know he's facing death here. He knows that he, he's probably writing this from prison, and he's facing death. And they're going to put, they're going to behead him, and he knows it's coming. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. And I've fought the good fight, I've finished the course, and I've kept the faith. That's the right. That's somebody that was concerned about his legacy and reputation. That he played out the two minutes, right? He played hard in the last two minutes to finish well. So this more this idea of being in a house of mourning, of facing our death, right? It, what he's saying that's that's how we live well. That forces us. That ought to force us to live well now. Now, and we're going to talk a little bit about looking back and looking ahead in just a minute. Remember when Adam was created back in Genesis 1, what he was supposed to do. He is created in the image of God, right? So our job is to bear the image of God to the last breath he gives us on the earth. That's our job. That's our job in, the, in this two-minute warning. It's to bear our bear his image with honor. That's the legacy, right? That's the legacy, the reputation you want to leave with is you bore God's name with honor to the last breath he gave you. Now, um, he's going to shift gears here a little bit and go to verse 5. And, and again, these are very practical, kind of pithy proverbs um, and, he's, and he's talking about how to live in the fear of the Lord and to live wisely, knowing that your time is short. So let me read five through nine. It's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of a fool. In that graphic. 
and this too is futility. For oppression makes a wise man mad, and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. And you have to read over these a while to figure out. They're kind of, they kind of go together, but if you read them one at a time, they sound disjointed. What he's calling us to do here is to live with discipline and with patience. Discipline and with patience. That team, we'll go back to our football picture. Two-minute warning comes on. We talked about how most teams have practiced their two-minute drill. They know if they got a score touchdown, they got to get down the field with two minutes. They have practiced that, right? So they have, when they go out there, they know what kind of plays they're going to run. They know if they have to, what they have to do to go fast, right? When you got you're on the clock. So they've practiced that. So there's discipline, right? There's discipline. Um, and that's, that's what he's calling us to do. It's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. You any, are the fools singing any songs around you in our culture? There's a lot of singing going on. Right? Uh, some really crazy stuff that people are talking about. But look around. It's better listen to the rebuke of a wise man. Look around you. Who is finishing well? Who's finished in their life in the service of God? Well? <coughs> go, talk, go talk to those people. Seek wise counsel from people that, that, are, that are bearing God's image well. You know, and I'm going to talk you know, our later years, okay? But look who's finishing well. Those are the people we ought to be emulating or, lit or seeking counsel from. There's, there's plenty of people around here that will give you all kinds of advice. Um, some, of it, some of it can get you off in the ditch pretty quick, I think. Particularly if you watch TV for more than about 15 seconds. <laughs> But, but that's what he's saying here. It's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man. Seek out people who are living the fear of God, living wisely, and emulate them. Listen to them. And if they've got correction or advice, you ought, to, you ought to bear that heavily. But there's a lot of people around us who will give us some bad advice. Verse 6, I love this. I love the Proverbs because they're, they're, they're so graphic. As the crackling of the thorn bushes under a pot, so there's there's kindling burning under a pot. Under a pot, it's going pop, 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 pop. You know how the water pops when you throw wet uh, leaves and stuff under the in the fire. So is the laughter of a fool. And it's all futility. It's just up in smoke. It's not lasting. It's up in smoke. So be real careful about who you get counsel from. Uh, there's all kinds of people who want to, particularly I'll, I'll talk about seniors. I'm in the group. Uh, there's all kinds of people who want to sell us wise counsel or sell us financial services or sell us this or this or this. But be careful. He's saying be careful here. There's all kinds of pe people who want to give you advice. A lot of it isn't any good. Now, verse 7 is... I'm sorry, you got an example? <laughs> well, we have a friend that we're, I invited for lunch tomorrow, and we're going to. <laughs> uh, well, Holly was looking at some material, and, and she, she read where if you don't get in fellowship with people, you have a greater tendency to start getting dementia. Oh. The social interaction yes. helps your mental function. Yeah, okay. And then we're going to tell her that tomorrow. <laughs> In a loving way. <laughs> In a loving way. Okay. Okay. Well, bring her, bring her, she, bring her, bring her next Wednesday. We, we can yeah. start. <laughs> okay, the other end of this, for oppression makes a wise man mad and a bribe corrupts the heart. There's all kinds of people with wrong motives around us. 
talks about oppression, making wise men mad, and a bribe corrupt in the heart. There's all kinds of poor counsel given because of wrong motives. And that's what he's warning about. The other, the other way you can look at these scriptures, he talks about laughter and oppression. There's ups and downs in life, right? You know, there's, you know, we've seen the seasons of life, okay, back to Ecclesiastes 3. But there's ups and downs in life, okay? So he's saying there's going to be time where there's laughter, there's going to be time when there's oppression, and you've got to fear God through all of that. Uh, you've got to fear God through all of that and bear his image well. Proverbs 13, 18. I'm going to be chasing some Proverbs tonight. Um, 13:18. Poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline, but he who regards reproof will be honored. Again, this idea, uh, I threw that in there, this idea of taking wise counsel, particularly as things change in life. Um, the other thing about this, that uh, uh, 1632 says kind of the same thing. This idea of having wise counsel and discipline. He who's slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit and he who captures the city. You can have control of your of your spirit, your control of your anger. That's living wisely here. So these ups and downs are going to come through life. So you got to approach them with wisdom and with discipline. And I want you to see this here. Wisdom. He's talking about he's talking about patience and humility and self discipline. What does that sound like that we talk a lot about in the New Testament? Wisdom, patience, discipline. The fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. <clears throat> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Mm -hmm. So he's really, he hadn't called it the fruits of the Spirit like we learn about in by that term in the New Testament, but that's what he's saying. Is live wisely with the, the things, that, the attributes we call the fruits of the Spirit. Patience, self-discipline, controlling your anger. I mean, we all probably know people that, particularly as they've aged, kind of angry and cranky and nothing satisfies them, and that kind of idea. And, and the preacher's telling us live wisely, live with balance. Live with self-discipline. Here, this, this is all about finishing well. Uh, James talks about this. And, and I've talked about this before. James is the wisdom book of the New Testament. So you see a lot of you'll see a lot of parallels of theme between Old Testament wisdom and the New Testament. So uh, James 1:19. Guess what? This you know, my brethren, beloved brethren, but let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Same idea, self-discipline, control of your speech, patience. I have to write that verse on my, uh, sometimes when I go to meetings or something, I write that verse across the top of the page <laughs> to help remind me, you know. Um, Look at James 5, 7, while you're there. Look at James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until he gets the early and late rains. This is self-discipline, patience, steadiness, right? It's all part of finishing well. But think about the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, uh, he doesn't come right out and say it that way, but that's what he's pointing you to, is living with the fruits of the Spirit. Now, this one, this one I thought we'd probably talk a lot about. Uh, look at chapter, uh, back in Ecclesiastes 7, and I'm going to start chapter, chapter, verse 10 to 12. Do not say, why is it for the, that the former days were better than these? 
In the good old days. The good old days, right? <laughs> yeah. For it's not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom along with an inheritance is good and an advantage to those who see the sun. For wisdom is protection just as money is protection. But the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the lives of its possessors. So what do you think there about verse 10? Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? You met anybody that constantly saying, well, back when so-and-so, <laughs> back when I lived in such and such a place, or back when I had that job, or back when I had that situation, everything was great. They can't let go of any of that to face today. Because they keep looking back. They can't look forward when it's constantly you're looking back. Prices were cheaper. <laughs> it was cheaper. It was cheaper. It was always cheaper back then. <laughs> but, but have you ever met anybody that lives that lives just trying to live their life this way, right? With a kind of in the rearview mirror, right? You're always it's looking a, back. You're stuck there. You're stuck. You're stuck. And the thing about it, were the good old days really the good old days? Yeah, you don't remember everything. Right. You're getting the bad things. Yeah, you kind of erase that part of the right. tape, right? This was good, but maybe this wasn't so good. Someone helped me with that one time, um, saying that God knew exactly what it was going to be like this time, and he let you be born at this time, and this is not a surprise to him that you're in this particular time frame. Right. We're all right where we're supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and that's one of the themes that we've been covering, God's sovereignty over the times, God's sovereignty over where he, the situations and places it's in. But, so there's a warning, there's a big warning here. This, this, this is a red flashing light verse here. There's a big warning not to try to live your life in the past. And again, I want you to think about the team with the two minute warning. They can't worry about what happened in the first quarter. They can't worry about when they scored the touch, you know, keep celebrating the touchdown they scored, and they can't worry about the fumble they made in, in the third quarter. Like, you know, the game's now. And that's what Solomon, or, you know, the preacher's talking to us about it. The game is now. But if we look back, we can, if we see things in our past, looking back, that we are aware that we will make us, has made us who we are today, then I think looking back sometimes on that grounds us into who God has made us for today. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'd say it this way. We should learn from the past, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't live in the past. Right. You can't wish you were still back right. then. Right, and, and we, we've kind of talked about as we've gone through this, the Lord takes us through these situations to shape and mold us mm -hmm. so we would fear him. And all that was for his, you know, he did all those things for good. We did, if, we were choose, if we were choosing, we would probably wouldn't do all those things or go through all those things. But that's the path he chose for us. So we should certainly learn from those. And we should certainly learn of God's providence. That's one of the themes of the whole old New Testament hits it too. The Old Testament just pounds on it. Remember. Remember. Remember your God. Remember what he's done. Remember how he provided for you. Remember when he was present with you. Remember when he dealt with your enemies. It's, so remember those things. But the warning tonight is you've got to live now. And you can't be locked up and frozen and imprisoned by your past. And, and I think we all, 
without naming names, have people's mind, have people's faces flashing in our mind. That's why there's so many with. psychiatrists that are. They can't, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. stuck. They're absolutely stuck. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And there's hard things, right? And there's hard things, and that's the power of God's Word and His Holy Spirit was to help us man, you know, manage those things because those things are powerful, and they leave scars, right? You can't always see them, but they're there. But that's a flashing light. Um, it's going to take you uh, again to one of Paul's writings in Philippians three, and as usual, he's pretty eloquent, pretty powerful. In Philippians, he's, he's kind of looking back over his life, right? So like said, he says, he's, he's learned a lot, all the things God's taken him through. And he gives you a whole list here of his, of his life in Philippians 3 and all the things he's done. But in verse 7, he says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Think about fearing God, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And then uh, go with me down to verse 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. He's in the two minute drill. I haven't won the game yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul's been through a lot of stuff. And he's saying that I got my eyes fixed on the goal. I've been through all this stuff and I'm not, I'm going to forget you know, he's obviously learned from all these things, but I'm going to forget these things because all they can do is bog me down because I'm headed toward the goal line. I'm headed toward the goal line. And that's pretty much what the preacher's telling us over here in Ecclesiastes. It's not wise to try to live in the past. Um, applying wisdom is the best. Uh, verse 11, wisdom along with an inheritance is good and an advantage to those who see the sun. Wisdom has advantages. Living in the fear of God with wisdom has advantages. Now, before, before he's contradicting himself, if you've been trailing along through the classes, because he's argued sometimes that wisdom isn't any good, and right? The wise guy and the fool, they all die. So what good is wisdom? He, he's... he's raised all those issues for us to deal with. But he's telling us that the fear of the Lord, living in wisdom with the fear of the Lord, has an advantage. And it's got even more advantage than money. Verse, um, but the advantage of knowledge, verse 12, is that wisdom preserves the life of its possessors. And there are several proverbs. I didn't, I'm not going to chase them with you. Night. There's several proverbs that talk about the power of fearing God to live wisely. It keeps you out of trouble. It does things for you that all the money in the world couldn't do. Right? There's all kinds of situations where all the money in the world can't get you out of, out of the pickle. Can't save your reputation. But what, living in the fear of the Lord has those advantages. So he's telling us to him in a drill live wisely live in the fear of the lord because it's advantageous to us verse the last two verses here are going to sound kind of familiar to you and so he's told us to live in the present now he's going to tell us to live with humility um again there's probably people that come to mind who get to a certain point in their life where they kind of think they have everything figured out and are more willing to tell people uh, how things should be, perhaps, uh, have a little pride about them. Well, he tells us to live humbly. We're going to live a short life, and, let's, and we're to live it humbly. Verse 13, consider the work of God. 
For who is able to straighten what he, he has been? We've seen that verse before. But earlier in Ecclesiastes, he told us the same thing. In the days of prosperity, be happy. But in the days of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not discover anything that will be after him. Consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has been? This is, we've seen this verse before. This, he's talking about God's sovereignty. And God doesn't reveal all of his providence to us. Why does God let this injustice happen now? And why does God let this happen now? And we've talked about this. We, could, we don't have the knowledge God does. So we, we didn't see what came before us, or not much before us. And we aren't going to get to see what comes after us. And we don't get to understand how God all, weaves all this to his glory. And God has bent <laughs> this, and we don't get to straighten it. And you can argue all day, you know, you can be angry, right? He's telling us you, there's no use in being angry with God. There's no use in trying to negotiate with God. He's trying to tell us to be humble and realize that God's at work. And we need to, be, we need to live in fear of, of what he's doing. We can live humbly before him. God is... Uh, who is able to straighten what he has been. There's, there's things that are out of our control. We're, we're completely human. He's not. He's completely divine. He's completely sovereign. And for us to question what he has done is kind of the height of pride, isn't it? So it's a warning, it's a warning to live humbly, is what this is. Now, verse 14 He's referring back to Job. I don't know if you picked up on that, but he's, he's talking about, he's asking you to think about Job. In the days of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not discover anything that will be after him. Let me take you to Job. Um, uh, Where's that? Job 2.10. Back ahead of Psalms. Uh, I, we've talked about this before. Psalm is always referring back to Proverbs and Job and the Psalms to the rest of the wisdom literature. Job 2.10. <laughs> and you remember this where Job, all of Job's material wealth has been wiped out. All of Job's kids have died. And finally, all of Job's personal health is now at risk and he's on the edge of death, and we find him, and he's sitting on the ash heap. Verse 8, and he took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Humility before God. We're in the two-minute drill. Our time's short. And one of the hallmarks of finishing well, living in the fear of the Lord, is, is a humility. To accept what God's, where God's put you and the opportunities given you and the situation he's given you. And, uh, and uh, Job, I mean, if Job can do what he did, can't we do, can't we do that? Uh, we're not, any of us, I know quite the bad shape that Job was in. But that's what he's admonishing us here. We learn from Job. The good times and the bad times and the in-betweens. If we can accept the good times from God, shall we not accept the bad situations? And trust him through those things too. So, and he says this so that a man may not discover anything that will be after him. And we, this is another one of the themes that we've had all through the book. We don't get to know how the story's going to end. We don't get to know how these situations that we've encountered in our life 
what God's doing with them in the generation that's to come. We don't get to know that part of the story. But the, but the, the, the challenge here, or the, the admonition here, is to live as the humility that Job had. To be able to accept what God's done, you know, the, the good times, as well as the not so good times, and to finish well. So, uh, uh, First Peter talks about finishing well. Uh, I wanted to show you Psalm 90, which kind of sums this up really well. Psalm 90, verse 12. Familiar verse, so teach us to number our days that we may present to thee a heart of wisdom. And that's what the preacher's admonishing us to do tonight. Live out this two-man drill with, with the wisdom of the fear of the Lord. Um, any thoughts? Of the, you, know, you know, any other thoughts or comments tonight? Jesus said, live one day at a time. Tomorrow is enough trouble for itself. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. God will take care of your tomorrow. Yep. Jay? Well, life is kind of like a, a, a pot that you cook food in. You put different ingredients in it. Some, some of the ingredients you may like and some of them you don't. And you cook it up and the end result is the result of all those individual ingredients and that's what our life is is a culmination of all the individual things that we have gone through good and bad not one better than the other the bad things are just as good as the good things to us but we learn from those things and uh, it makes us who we are and if we learn from the bad as well as the good <laughs> and we understand that God is sovereign in all of this Mindset of humility and appreciating all that. Yeah. If you have a life that's nothing but good, do you really appreciate the good as much as you would if you went through bad things? We'd be pretty spoiled kids, wouldn't we? Yeah. 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 So we got to be like Job. That's kind of where he leaves us tonight. We got to be like Job. We got to finish well, whether it's good or hard, and to do it with the, the fear of the Lord. Again, I would condense what we covered tonight, but think about the fruit of the Spirit. It's all about patience and humility and self-discipline. Finish well with those attributes. So that, like I said, now you know, we're getting into the more practical kind of part of the book tonight. So I had some questions for you to think about. So are you living with the end in mind, like you told us to do tonight? If, you know, if you've not trusted Christ, do it tonight. Two minute in the morning. Remember, we don't get, we don't know how long this game is going to go on. But if you've not trusted Christ, do it tonight. He's the only certainty. The, uh, the other thing I was going to ask you are, you, are you thinking about your legacy? Are you thinking about your legacy? Are you seeking God's wisdom and applying it today in the present situations? And thinking about the kind of person you want to end up being? Are you, are you using those, at, you know, the fruits of the Spirit in whatever situation you're in? Patience, humility, long-suffering. Are you using those kinds of attributes today? Uh, are you trying to live in the past? Are you things you can't let go of? I got a couple things that Luke tells me, get over it. <laughs> but uh, are, 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 you lit, are, you, are you bitter or afraid of, because of things in your past? Turn those over to the Lord and, and let, ask him for the freedom to live today, today and not try to relive the past. Well, Satan will bring up those things. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He will throw it in your face. And remember, remember yeah. when you goofed up here? Remember those words you used? Um, the other thing I wanted you to ask, think about, you know, 
we've talked about living in the fear of the Lord as an act and in, 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 in living with contentment, right? That's another theme that runs all through the book as an a deliberate act of, wisdom, of worship. It's a deliberate choice, a deliberate act of worship. Um, but I, I would just ask you to think of it as an act of worship. To, act, to live in the fear of the Lord, thinking about your reputation, your legacy, thinking about uh, what you're going to leave behind is an act of worship. To live in the fear of the Lord. And the last part I was going to give you for a little bit of homework. Have you ever written your obituary? <laughs> serious. Serious here. It's better to be in the house of mourning than to be in the house of feasting. Try it this week. Go home and, and take a half hour or so and maybe, maybe just jot out some notes. But write your obituary. We talked about Living in a good name is better than a good ointment. So what's your legacy going to be? Go home and write your obituary. You don't have, you know, do, even it's just a paragraph or two. But write, take the time and think about what your obituary will be. It's better to be in the house of mourning than in the house of feasting. Everybody went quiet on that one. <laughs> I don't want to be bragging or anything. Anybody sound like, well, I don't want my situation to sound like poor or. I think you should write what you want people to remember. You want me to write yeah, it. Yeah. Which is not, yeah. I know. Please, please. Let's talk them right back. <laughs> yeah, there was a, uh, for the camera, there's a volunteer here uh, being willing to write somebody else's obituary here. But you know, I, I pray all the time for Godly wisdom about certain things. And I, I, I expect God, if I pray for that, I expect or I look for God to answer that in some way. He will. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. The yeah. James says. Yeah. But rather than call it bragging, I think you should put what you would like people to remember about you. Yeah. Rather than say it's bragging. But I, I just would uh, put that on you as a little bit of, uh, of homework tonight. Wrote something like that. It's in an envelope for my daughter. It, just to, you know, verses that are important to me, songs that were important to me, and hopefully that conveys my life. You know, yeah. these are the things yeah. that were important to me. Yeah. Anybody else thought about this or done something? Well, my this son direction? has been after me to write that. And I'm wondering, why do they want me to write my obituary up? So they don't have to. Do they think I'm dying and I don't know what But the point Psalm is made, we're all dying. I know I'm all we're dying. All, we're all dying. We're all on the clock. Just not ready today. Huh? Just, I just not today. Just not ready to blow the whistle. <laughs> hey, right now. <laughs> So I'll, I'll leave you with that tonight. That's that's your homework challenge tonight. Go home and write your obituary. And bring it next week. Then. You want, if you want, if you want, to, if you know, if you want to share that next week, that's fine. But this is his point tonight. Being in the house of mourning sobers us up about how we should live. And to finish well, we're going to live with the, the fear of the Lord. Anything else tonight? I thought that probably, probably <laughs> generate some discussion. Well, let's pray and we'll close tonight. Mighty Lord, we thank you for your truth tonight and how you do sober us up with your word. Your word is not for cowards. We thank you for convicting us about these things tonight, Lord. Help us to walk out of here tonight in humility and to walk with you in the fear of the Lord this week. Help us to live today, Lord, and not in the past, and not be chained to the things of the past, but to trust you for yesterday, now, and the future. We thank you for your providences, Lord, that we can't change and we can't know, and we praise you for these things. Thank you again, Lord Jesus, 
for being our Savior and being sovereign over 